Okay, thank you very much for joining today's lecture. So today what we are going to talk about is uh, data modeling in MongoDB. So, so far we talked everything about the relational database using MySQL. And um, last time we talked about the introduction to big data. So we discussed a little bit about what's the unique characteristics of big data and why relational database sometimes doesn't work and how big data uh, is able to resolve those kind of problems. And among NoSQL, there are many different technology, but uh, we are going to use MongoDB, which is the most popular uh, database system uh, in NoSQL. So we are going to use that. So let's just start today's class. And also uh, today's class, we will have a lot of like step-by-step -step, uh, hands-on exercise. So uh, if you, I asked you last time to install MongoDB and Robo3T on your laptop or PC or Mac. So if you already installed and set up everything correctly, you may use those to follow what I'm doing here. So I go at the slower pace so that you have enough time to catch up and follow what I'm doing here. So Robo3T is a, a client uh, software for MongoDB. So uh, you install the MongoDB community server on your PC. So that's the server where the data is stored. And Robo3T is a client software tool, which we are going to use to connect to MongoDB server and to send a request to the MongoDB server. So we are going to use this. And in the last time when I shared the, uh, how to set up MongoDB and Robo3T slide, um, there was in, like uh, all the information about how to connect to MongoDB server from Robo3T. Basically, uh, you can turn on the Robo3T and you can follow these steps. Let me just uh, uh, show this and let's uh, just do this together. So here in my case, uh, I already installed the Robo3T here. So if you installed everything, including Robo3T, you can click this to open it. So I click Robo3T and open it. Then this will be the first screen you will see. Uh, let me change the resolution a little bit. Let me see. Uh, should be fine. Okay. Mm, let's just see. Okay. Okay. So this will be the first screen you will see. So if you open Robo3T, you will see this window saying MongoDB connections. So if your MongoDB is installed correctly and set up correctly, you will see uh, there is that this uh, local database already uh, shown here. So there's local database with the IP address, basically local host, which is your, uh, your local computer and the port number of MongoDB. So if you see this like this, then you can just click this, select it, and you can click connect. Then you should be able to connect to your MongoDB server if you don't see this option, you can click this create uh, option here on the top left corner of the window. If you click this, it will ask you to put necessary information. So you can type the information as shown on the slide. Then if your MongoDB server is installed correctly, you should be able to connect to your server. So you can do that. And if everything looks okay, you can click connect button to connect to your MongoDB server. So let me close this work contact and this is the screen here. So now I connected to my MongoDB server. So here you can see that the local DB, the local database, which is a MongoDB server that I have in my computer, which is shown here correctly. There's a system folder and configuration folder and test IB folder like this. So I made some folders here, but basically if you see something here with the local DB, then you should be uh, like you are good to go. So you are connected to the MongoDB server correctly. So all the information is here. So let's get back to the slide. So as I discussed you uh, just now, on the left side of our, you will see the database, admin database, local database, and those information. Uh, those will be all listed on the left side of our. And by default, uh, you probably noticed that when you connected to MongoDB server, there was no authentication. So in the when we use MySQL, when you connect to your MySQL server, you have to type the root account and root account password. So there was some kind of authentication step. But in this case, in the MongoDB, 
there is no authentication for the local server. So we will just use this for a kind of a test practice and development purpose. So uh, the authentication in by default is not required. But later in the future, uh, if you want to add a user account, you can do that. And after that, you can kind of enforce authentication. So we will talk about that in the future of this course. Uh, but today and for the next few weeks, we will just use it without any uh, authentication. So basically, as your user, you are going to use this system using some of the graphical and user interface. Uh, so there's Robo 3T, using Robo 3T. The Robo 3T will uh, communicate with the MongoDB by connecting to the MongoDB server. So there will be system level communication between server and the client. And as us, a user, we are going to use this Robo 3T as a client to send a request to the MongoDB server. So that's the basic setup. And let me talk more about now how the data will be stored in MongoDB server. So if you remember the relational database like MySQL, then our data will be stored in a table, like a table format. So we create a table, table contains multiple columns and each row of information will be stored in a table. So each cell will contain one data. So that's uh, the basic kind of uh, uh, data storage in the relational database. And in MongoDB, we are going to use something as a document. So MongoDB will store data at BSUN document. Then probably uh, many of you heard about BSUN for the first time. So what is a BSUN? So BSUN actually refers to a binary representation of JSON document. Then the question is, uh, then what is JSON? So JSON is JavaScript object notation. So if you are familiar with the JavaScript and this type of data, then probably you heard about JavaScript object notation. Uh, basically, it's one way of representing data as a human readable format. So we are going to talk more about how this type of document looks like. Uh, but basically, it is a human readable plain text format for expressing structured data with the support in many different programming languages. So it's kind of a popular format. So let's just see how the BSON document looks like and how MongoDB structured the data in a document format. So in the MongoDB, the documents are composed of field and value pairs. Uh, sometimes we call this as key and value too. So in the MongoDB, uh, we use the term field and the term key uh, kind of interchangeably. So you don't need to worry about this. We are using these two terms interchangeably. And in MongoDB, document looks like this. So first of all, each document stores a certain type of data. So you can consider each document as each row of information in table in a relational database. So in a relational database, when we have a table, uh, each row of information uh, refers to like uh, unique information, right? So if we have a cu customer table, first customer information might be about uh, Tom, second customer information will be about Jenny, something like that. So in MongoDB, document contains a unique information, basically. So in the MongoDB, when you represent a document, when you represent data as a document format, the document starts with uh, this open bracket. So this refers to start of document. And in the end, you have to put close the bracket. So close bracket refers to end of document. So basically from here, start of document to the end of document, it refers to one document. So one document that contain a certain information about someone or something like this. And inside the document, we represent field and value. So currently here, we have a field name, field age, field status, field group like this. And then after field, we specify column and then we specify the value. So the name is a Sue, age is a 26, status is a groups is a list of news and sports. Basically, uh, this document uh, is about the person whose name is Sue, 
and her age is 26. Her status is A. She belongs to two groups, news group and sports group like this. That's what we can know. So, and when we have a multiple document after each pair of field and value, we specify a comma to uh, go to the next field like this. So that's the basic structure of the document in MongoDB. So basically document composed of field and value pairs. So that's how MongoDB stores data as a document structure. So there are several uh, unique characteristics we have to know about MongoDB document. Uh, first of all, document can be of any size. So there is no uh, restriction of how many fields uh, to be included in each document. So some documents can be uh, really big with many different fields. Some documents might be really small with only a few or one or two fields. So there's no risk specific restriction. So that's one of the difference between relational database and the MongoDB. So in the relational database, you remember that when you design table, you have to specify columns. So you do conceptual data modeling and you do relational data modeling. And in the end, you will know exactly how many columns exist in each table. But in MongoDB, there is no such a structure. Every document, there is no predetermined, there is no pre-specified columns. When you design document, you just add any number of fields you want. So some document for Claudia, it may have a, like one field like this, only name like this. And some documents may have more than one field like this. Some documents may have two fields, that's a fine. And another thing is that the fields in documents are case sensitive, which means that if you have a field with a low case letter, like the name, and if you have another field name with the uppercase letter, like this, so this is such with the low case or N, and this is such with the capital N like this. In that case, MongoDB is a case sensitive, so they will consider uh, these two fields are different fields. So this is different from uh, MySQL. So if you remember in MySQL, uh, it is not case sensitive. So if you, you cannot have uh, two fields with the same name like this, but in MongoDB, it's okay. They are case sensitive, so you may have the uh, have two fields uh, with a different like the case, like the uppercase, lowercase. Then MongoDB will consider them differently. And another thing is that the documents cannot have the same fields. So, but uh, if you have exactly the same characters for the field name, then it's not allowed. And that's another thing you can consider here. I mean, that's kind kind of intuitive. So that's the basic characteristics of MongoDB documents. Another thing is this, in MongoDB, now a collection refers to a set of documents. So you have a multiple documents like this, and you put them together, then it becomes a collection. So it's similar to a kind of a table structure. So if you think about the relational database, you have a multiple rows of data, and when you like put all those different information in each row in a table, then it becomes a table. So MongoDB is the same. You may have a, a customer Claudia and customer Leo and customer Barry. So for each customer, you have a three documents and you put them together, then it becomes a customer collection. In this case, something like a user collection like this. And another important characteristic is that documents in collection does not need to follow the same structure. So that's another important uh, consideration here. Okay. So in this case, it's possible that like one document in the user collection may have a friend field like this, and another document may have a job field and another document may have a gender field, that's totally fine. It's not necessary for every document in the same collection to have the same uh, field. It's not necessary. Every document is unique. So every document may have a different field. That is totally fine in this case. 
So that's why uh, when you talk about no SQL, uh, we are saying that it supports a flexible data structure because there's no restriction over what kind of field you can have. There's no restriction how many fields you can have, something like that. And when you uh, put the value inside the field in the document, there are several data types you can use. Um, and typically in MongoDB, you can utilize more different and more flexible data structure uh, as data for each field. And another thing is that in relational database, when you design the database system inside the table for each field, you have to pre-specify a certain data type. But in the MongoDB, again, it supports a flexible data modeling. So for each field in the document, you don't need to specify what data type they will use. You can just assign any value into field, then that field will contain that data type. So a uh, common data type you can utilize in MongoDB are these things. I mean, there are more, but these are some of the common things you may utilize. Uh, a lot in the practice. The first one, there could be null. So uh, there could be null. So for example, you made a field. So the document has this field X. However, you do not want to put any information. You want to make this field to be empty. Then you can utilize this null data type. So you can use null for non-existing field. And you can also use a true or false. Basically, you can use a Boolean data type to represent binary uh, representation. And also you can use number, of course. You can also use a string, uh, like texture description or texture data. You can also use date and time information and put that inside the field. So if you make, when you make a new document, you want to add the current date or current time into the field, you can use this function, new date, then current date and time will be assigned into this field X like this. Also, you may have a, a list data type. So if you are familiar with the program language, uh, probably you are also familiar with this list data type. So list is a, a kind of a data structure. Basically, inside the list, there are multiple elements like this. So you can use your list, and you can assign that data into field two. That's also possible. And also, Another powerful thing is that MongoDB is actually uh, supports the JavaScript environment, uh, which means that you can actually code some JavaScript programming and you can use JavaScript function and you can assign that as a data into a field. That's also possible. So if you want to uh, if you utilize MongoDB for more personalized usage and more powerful usage, then uh, you can design JavaScript code and assign that into a field that's also possible. So that's another things you can do. So it's quite flexible as you see here. Okay, so that's the basic uh, data types you can utilize here in MongoDB. And another very important and unique data type you can utilize in MongoDB is embedded document. So what it means is that uh, this is actually quite similar to the subquery we talked about last time in the relational database. So when we design SQL, uh, sometimes we have the main query and we also design subquery and we embed the subquery inside the main query. So here it's a similar concept. You can have a certain document and you can use that document as a sub document and embed it into the main document. That's also possible. So if you look at this example clearly, uh, there's this red part, uh, which is starts with uh, here, right? This uh, uh, tells open, basically this tells the start of the document, right? So the document starts from here and there's also end of the bracket. So basically it tells end the document, right? End of the document. So you can see that there is embedded document here. So inside this red part, inside this sub document, we have a street field, city field and country field. So this is like one document which contains three fields and we can put that as a data inside this address field in the main document. So the main document starts from here and end here. So inside this main document, we have two fields, name field 
with the key address field and with this embedded document like this. So here's the main document. And inside the main document, we have an embedded document. So later, uh, we'll talk more about the importance of embedded document, but embedded document structure is actually very um, important in the MongoDB. So we can talk more about this later. And now let's uh, explore a little bit about the Robo3T and let's try to communicate with the MongoDB a little bit to get familiarize ourselves with uh, the basic environment and basic system here. So there are many information uh, like uh, I put on the slides. So you can follow this to try by yourself too. So I try this uh, to show you how we can do it. So uh, if you want, you can also follow and you can also check this, how this works. Okay, so this is the basic MongoDB structure as I showed you earlier. So we have a local database currently connected here. And inside here, we have some database like this. So if you want to make your own database here inside the MongoDB server, then you can follow this step here. So here there's local DB. So this is your uh, database server installed on your PC. So if you want to make uh, some place to store your data, then first of all, you need to have a database. So you can right click on local DB here. Then there are several options. And here on the third one, there's this option saying create database. So if you want to create new database on your server, you can click this create database. Then here in this uh, uh, window, you can type a database name, which you want to create. So another information here is this, basically it shows the connection to your local database server. So it's, uh, it's showing which database server you are connected currently. And if you type some database name, that database will be created in this server. So we can type something like uh, test EA, something like that. And let me click create. Then you can see that test BA database is here created like this. So we can open, then there will be collection folder, function folder, user folder like this. So in the future, you can add a collection function user into this database. And another thing is that once you have a database, now you can utilize this database. So you can do something on this database. So usually, um, if you want to do something in the MongoDB, you can utilize MongoDB share. So basically, it's kind of an environment. You can type something or code, code something to communicate with your database in MongoDB server. So if you want to open a share for this database, uh, you have to first choose which database you want to work with. So it's similar to the MySQL. If you remember MySQL, before you perform a certain query, you have to select a database and tell that which database you are going to use to perform a query. It's exactly the same here. Uh, first of all, you have to choose database. So let's say that I want to use this test BA database. Then you can click this and right click on this. And the first option here is open share. So you can click this open share. So let's click it and see what happens. Then you will see there's this tab saying new share appeared on the screen here. So the information here is this, basically in this new share, it tells you information about the connection, local database, and the server address and the port number, localhost 27017, basically uh, my local computer and the MongoDB port number. And currently we are under test BA database. So if you type something here, if you code something, that will be performed on this test BA database on this local server. That's what we can know here. So that's the uh, share, the MongoDB share environment is here. So as I told you earlier, the so MongoDB supports the JavaScript environment. So you can code some, you can program some JavaScript code here and you can use that to interact with the database too. So that's also possible. And you can also utilize the MongoDB query function here to communicate with the MongoDB server too. So you can do many things here utilizing this shell here. 
And if you type some code, uh, so in the future, if you type some code here, and if you want to perform the code, you can use this play icon on the top menu here. If you click this, whatever you type here will be performed. So let's create and run some JavaScript code and let's just see how it works. So I prepared some sample JavaScript code on the slide. So you can type this if you want and see how this works. So let me try here. The first one I type print hello world. So this is a simple JavaScript code saying hello world. And one, two, three multiplied by four, five, six. And I can also define the variable k initialized with zero. And I can use the first statement and iterate the value i from one or zero to 100. And then on variable k, I can add all the number from 0 to 100. So basically, I want to know what is the sum of the number from 0 to 100 and all these things. So I type this uh, simple JavaScript code here. And then if I want to perform again, I can click this play icon on the top. So let me click this. Then the results of my code will be shown here. So you can see there are three tabs. The first tab is for the first part of the code. Uh, basically, for this first part of the code, the result is shown on the first tab, hello world. For the second code, the result will be shown on the second tab. So one, two, three multiplied by four, five, six will be this number. And the last code here, the result will be shown here on the last tab. So if I sum up all the number from zero to 100, uh, it will be 50, 50, like this. 50, 150, like this. So you can try this. So basically any JavaScript code, you can run it here. So in addition to providing a JavaScript coding environment, you can also utilize many different functions in MongoDB to interact with the MongoDB server here. The functions you can utilize are these things basically there is create read update and delete operations so you can utilize a function to do this crud operations what we call uh, in mongodb so here if you want to let's try this so if you want to design a document you can type something like this so what's shown on the slide so i can use test variable and inside the test variable i can assign uh, document. So name, key, address is an embedded document. And there is a street field inside an embedded document, basically 12 Chakchung Street, which is uh, our school build as uh, a school address. And city, Shatin, country, Hong Kong, China, like this. Okay, so we type this. And then if you perform this, if I click this play icon on the top, this is the result. So basically inside the test variable, we assigned this document. And here it says there is one document here. So it shows some information. So currently it says uh, there's one document and the value, there are two fields. Yeah, we have two fields, right? Name field and address field. So if you open this document, you can see the structure of this document. So we have name field with the value key, address field with the three fields as an embedded document. So if I open address, I can see that street field, the city field, country field are embedded inside address field as an embedded document like this. So this show this is basically how the document uh, structure is shown here in this Robo3T client. So that's how we can also create a document in the MongoDB. Okay, so now the thing is this. So we are able to create document 
like this in the MongoDB. However, once we make a document or once we have a document, we want to store this, right? So it's just similar to the relational database. In the relational database, when we have a data about something or someone, we want to store it inside a table. In MongoDB, when you have a document to describe a certain characteristic, we want to store that inside a collection. So we discussed this earlier. So when we have a multiple documents, we store that, we combine that together, and we call it as a collection. So in this case, let's try to create a collection. So creating collection is quite uh, straightforward. So under test BA database, we have this collection folder. So if you want to create new collection to store data, then you can simply right click on this collection folder. So on this collection folder under test BA database, right click on it, then there's a create, uh, create collection option here. So you can click this create collection. Then it will ask you to make a new name for the collection. So currently it shows additional information like which server you are connected to, which database you are using. So if you make a collection, it will be saved inside this test PA database. So let's make uh, like some collection, say customer like this. And if I click create, then that's it. You can see that there's number one next to the collection folder. It means if I open collection folder, there's one collection called customer like this. So that's how you can create a collection in MongoDB in the robot city like this. So that's one way of creating a collection using user interface in the robot city. You can also use this shared environment to create a collection too. So one way is that I can right click on the test BA database and I can click open share again to make a new share here. And to create a collection, you can specify something like this, DB. So DB means the current database. Current database is basically a test BA database here, test BA database in this local server. So DB refers to test BA database. And in this database, we want to make create collection. So use the create collection function. And here you can type customer one because we already have a customer collection and close the parenthesis like this. And if you perform this query, if you perform this code, basically uh, customer one collection will be created under test BA database. So if I click play icon on the top, Okay, it's performed. And on the left side bar, the collection number is not changed. It's because we have to refresh after we learn something on the here. So right click on the test BA database. And if you click refresh, then now you will see that collection, there are two collection and customer and customer one, we just created it right now. So that's another way to create collection like this, utilizing the share option. And other operation uh, we can perform in MongoDB in using uh, Robust3T are these things. So there are create, read, update, delete operations we can perform. So let me go through it, uh, go through one by one briefly. So to perform this operation, first of all, you can simply right click on your collection and then you can choose which operation you want to perform. So create is for insert documents for create, view documents for read, update documents for update, remove documents to delete some of the documents you have inside your collection. So let's try this first. Let's try to add a document into your customer collection we just created. Then you can follow this step. So here, Let's just say that inside the customer collection, we want to add a document. Then you can like, uh, you can select this customer collection first and right click on it. And the second option is insert document. So you can click this, click insert document. And it will show this window. So here, uh, basically you can see that there is a um, open bracket. So start of document, close bracket, end of document. So between this, we can type a field and value we want to add inside the document. So let's type something what we see on the slide. 
something like this. And other as as an embedded document, just like what we did earlier. Okay, something like this. So after you type everything, um, there are some options here. As you can see, there is a uh, validate option. So if you want to make sure what you type is your current document structure, you can click validate option. Then it tells you whether there is any error or not. So in this case, JSON is valid. So we don't have any error in this document. And if you click save button, it will be saved into customer collection. Yeah, so that's the one way of uh, saving a document into collection using the user interface of the Robots 3T. And also, there are other ways to store document into the collection. So on other ways, are utilizing this share option. So in the share environment, we can also type, and we can actually type the function and code to insert document into the collection. And this option is actually more powerful, especially if you want to uh, add multiple documents at the same time. So the option you can use are this. Uh, you can use a insert function. So you can specify database, the current database, and then you can specify the collection name where you want to add your document into. So customer collection, we want to add the document into, then specify customer and insert, use the insert function. So, and then specify the document. So this document will be added into customer collection like this. If you want to add multiple documents at the same time, you can do the same thing, db.customer.insert function. And here you can specify a list of documents. Then all the documents inside the list will be added into customer collection. So here are some of, there are some of the examples. So the example on the left side is basically adding one document into customer collection. And the example here on the right side are adding three documents into customer collection at once by utilizing insert function. So you can, uh, let me do this really quickly just to show you how this works. So this can be done very simply. So in this, let's use, utilize this share because it's the same share using this test to be a database. So we can make something like the C1. Let me just do the example on the right side. Then we can make the, one document with name Claudia, and I can make another document with the name Leo, and I can make another document with a name field, and the value is very like this. So I created the three documents, and if I want to add just one document into customer, select, customer collection, then I can type db database dot customer collection name dot insert, and C1 like this. Then C1 is the document name with the Claudia. So that one will be added into customer collection. If I want to add multiple documents into customer collection, I can specify insert the function. And inside here, I can specify a list. And inside the list, I can specify multiple documents like this. So if I perform, both will work fine. So type this, and if I click play icon on the top, here is the result. So C1 is this, C2 document to look like this, C3 document to look like this, and this part, insert the function, it's done here. So it inserted the one record. And this part is done here. It says insert one record because there is one uh, list data type, but actually it has uh, all the documents inside the list. So by doing this, we added all these three documents into customer collection. So that's another way of adding document into collection by utilizing insert function.
So the next one, what we want to do is this. So now we made the collection and inside the collection, we added multiple documents. Then what we want to do is that we want to retrieve those documents. We want to check what kind of information is stored inside the collection. Then we can utilize this option. So you can right click on a certain collection you want to see, and you can choose view document option. Then you can see all the documents inside a collection. So let's try this. So here, uh, let me right click, let me choose the customer collection first. And let me, let's, uh, if I want to see what documents are stored inside this collection, I can right click on the customer. And the first option says view documents. So you can click this. If I click view documents, here are the results. So we, so far we added the four documents and they are all here. So basically in this screen, each of this is the document we added. So if you open the first one, it has a name field, address field with the three embedded fields. Second document has a name Claudia, third name Leo, fourth name Barry, like this. So we have all the documents we added so far into a customer collection like this. And another interesting thing is this, like uh, uh, this one, ID field. We, when we design our document, we never edit this ID field, right? But when we add the document into collection, this ID field is generated automatically. So that's uh, what MongoDB is doing. So whenever you add a document into a collection, the MongoDB will generate this ID field automatically with a random or like increasing value. So this is, uh, will be assigned as an ID into every document in a collection. So you can consider this as something like a primary key uh, in the relational database. But just in the case of MongoDB, uh, they are making it automatically if you didn't define ID field like this. So that's something you can notice. And also there are share script options. So you can also uh, use the MongoDB share to see documents stored inside the collection. So the function you can use are find and find the one function. So basically uh, you can specify database name and the collection name, which you want to see. And then you can use the find the function. And if there's nothing, then it will show entire documents stored inside customer collection. Also you can use find the one function. If you use find the one function, uh, only the first document stored in the customer collection will be shown as a result. So it's just something like this. So if we try, I can close this and I can right click on the test BA database, click open share. And here I can type db.customerCollection.find function. And also I can use db.customerCollection and find one function like this. So if I perform this, the results between these two are slightly different uh, like this. For the first one, if I use find the function on the customer collection, the entire documents will be shown as a result like this, right? So all four documents will be shown here as a result. But if we use this find one function on the customer collection, the first document in the customer collection will be shown here as a result. So let's just say that you don't want to retrieve the entire document from a collection. You just want to see what kind of information is stored inside the customer collection. Then you can just use your find one function to retrieve one document and see and check what kind of information is stored in that collection. So that's what you can do utilizing these two functions. So that's the read document operation basically. So we briefly talked about create operation, creating document, and read operation, reading document. Uh, next operation is an update document. So it's a similar to update the query in the relational database. Uh, you can do the same thing. You can right click on a collection and there will be update document option. So you can click it, you can uh, 
design a query to update the document. So in this case, for update GUI option is the same as the share option because uh, if you utilize this user interface option, basically the Robo 3T will prepare this uh, update function. So inside here, you can design your query, you can design your update rule, you can design option, update option. And then you can perform this query in the MongoDB shell. So it is exactly the same as the shell option. And this part, uh, actually, we are not going to talk about today. Uh, in the next class, um, we are going to talk more about how to utilize this update function and aggregate function. So just uh, you can just know that this feature exists there. And we are going to talk more about this next time. So this is the uh, uh, same thing, basically in the shell script, in the MongoDB shell, uh, you can design this update function. Uh, you can specify database, collection name, and you can specify update function and specify query, update rule, option rule, like this, following example here. So let me skip this part for now. And another uh, operation you can utilize is delete operation. So now you can you want to delete some documents in a collection, you can use this delete function or delete operation. So again, for this option, the graphical user interface option in the robot 3 t is exactly the same as the share option. So we will just go to the share. So on the database, you can right click and you can choose open share and there you can use this remove function. When you use remove function, you can delete the entire documents in a collection or you can specify a, some rule, some query to delete a certain documents in a collection. So there are two different ways. And both can be done by using removal function. So you specify database that collection name, which you want to delete documents from. So customer collection dot removal function. And here, if you specify simply open bracket and end bracket without nothing inside, then it will delete or documents inside the collection. And between this open and end bracket, if you type some query, like a name field should be key, then it will delete only those documents that satisfy query you specify here. So in this case, we are saying that delete all the documents when name field contains key like this. And here, there's one thing you have to notice. So I write down this here. Basically, if you want to remove the entire document from a collection, let's say that we have a customer collection, uh, but somehow you want to remove all the customer information and you want to start again. Then instead of using remove function, there is actually a better way. The better way is using a drop function. So drop function is used to drop a collection, basically remove function is to remove documents but if you use drop function it will remove the entire collection at once so how to use you can specify database dot collection name which you want to remove dot drop function like this then it will delete the collection with all documents inside so if you want to remove all documents in the collection uh, actually it's better to drop the collection entirely why it's because the speed of dropping collection is much faster than removing all the documents. So it's something like this. So let's say that here you have some collection. So collection is basically a collection of documents, right? So you have many different documents inside one collection. And what's happening is that if you use remove function, this this removal function will delete one document one by one. So if you use a removal uh, function to delete all the documents, then basically this function will go here into collection and look at the first document and it will delete. Look at the second document and it will delete. Look at the third document and it will delete. So if you have a lot of documents in a collection, it will take a long time because it has to delete one document one by one like this. However, if you use a dropping collection, basically use the drop function on the collection, then this function will simply not checking 
all the documents, it will simply go to the collection level and it will simply remove the collection. So that's why dropping collection is much faster. So here are some examples. So what I'm doing here is this. Uh, I type this following code in the MongoDB shell and my purpose is generating two database, ABC1 and ABC2, uh, each with 50,000 documents. Oh, actually it's not the database, two collections to be more correct. So let me type this and let me explain how this works in the MongoDB shell. So let me show you this. So let me close this. Let me right click on the test BA database and let me click open share to make a new share here. And let me type this code. So L1 is your list, empty list. L2 is also empty list. I use first statement. I iterate from zero to 50,000 like this. And on the L1, which is empty list, I use a push function to add document. So document is just a random document I just made up. So it has just two field, two field and two field. And the uh, data there are actually uh, not really meaningful. I'm just uh, making a document, like a random document and putting it inside L1 and L2. Like this. So what's happening so far is this. So to briefly explain again, so L1 and L2 both to start with the empty list. And here I use a first statement to iterate for 50,000 times. And during this 50,000 times over iteration, uh, I make this uh, uh, document. So I, I do for fun uh, with like two fields and these documents will be added into L1 and L2 using the push uh, operate, uh, function. So in the end, L1 will contain a list of 50,000 documents and L2 will also contain a list of exactly the same 50,000 documents. And then I use this function database.abc1. So currently we don't have any collection with the abc1 name, right? So I make a new, so MongoDB will create a new collection automatically if we do this. In ABC1 collection, I add, I insert L1, basically a list of 50,000 documents. Do the same thing on the ABC2 collection. Use the insert function and add 50,000 of documents. So do this. And if I perform this query, uh, this code, then it's done. Uh, now I go to test the BA database, right click on it. And if I choose refresh, it's refreshed. And you can see ABC1 and ABC2 here. So if I right click on ABC1 view documents, there are 50,000 documents here with exactly the same format. ABC2, same, 50,000 documents with exactly the same uh, documents. So basically I created ABC1 collection, ABC2 collection, which uh, contains 50,000 exact same documents. And what I want to do here is this. I want to test and compare the speed between uh, remove function and drop function. So I'll do this. So let me go back to here. And let's make a new share. And here I'll test db.abc1.remove. So first of all, in this share, I try this. Basically, this code is telling that I want to remove all documents from ABC1 collection. So let me perform. So deleting all the documents from ABC1 collection took about uh, 0 0.947 seconds. So 946 milliseconds, basically. Make a new share. And let me try another code. This time, instead of remove everything, I use drop function to remove ABC2 collection. And if I perform this code, now you can see it's really fast. I didn't even wait. It took only 0 0.008 seconds. So you can see the difference between time, right? In, in this uh, 
instance, uh, basically using drop function was about 100 times faster than using removal function to delete all the data in a certain context, in a certain collection. So that's something you have to notice. And the question is this. Now you know what is faster, right? So there is a certain reason why drop function is much faster because drop function just go to the collection level and remove the collection entirely. And why I am showing this? It's because of the big data fallacy. So big data fallacy is something like this. In the organization or in a company, there are some situation or sometimes they may have to deal with a lot of data and they heard about this new technology. They heard about this big data technology and they heard that um, they heard like from other people that if you use big data technology, everything will be so fast. So you can handle big data much easily. However, it is not always the case. If you, the big, like when you utilize big data technology, it will give you speed premium and performance premium only when you utilize well only when you understand how the big data works and only when you utilize this technology well, it will give you speed and performance premium. If you just adopt the big data technology without knowing how this works, then actually in many cases, I see that the speed and performance decrease. So that's just something you have to be careful. So it also applies into data modeling in MongoDB. So earlier I mentioned that in NoSQL and also in MongoDB, data modeling is flexible. So you don't need to go through complex conceptual data modeling. You don't need to go through any relational data modeling. You just design document structure and you just add any field you want. However, it doesn't mean that you can really uh, design document structure in any way you want. You have to be more careful. So I'm gonna show you some examples here. And there are two widely used approach when people utilize MongoDB to design and do data modeling. And these two are embedding or referencing design choice. So let's assume, uh, let's just think about this scenario. So last time we talked about this scenario of a customer has a phone number and let's use the same example. So let's uh, uh, assume that we want to keep the customer information like a name and customer's details and also phone number information. Basically it's the number uh, the customer has. Some customer may have many phones and some customer may have only a few phones like this. In this case, there could be two possible and two potential design choices in MongoDB when you design the data model. First option is embedding. If you use embedding, basically you will make a customer collection. So customer collection, each document in the customer collection will contain customer information. And then you will embed a list of phone number into customer document. So that's possible. So or like if a customer has a multiple phone number, you will make a list of multiple phone number and you just embed it inside customer document. Another design choice is referencing. So you make a customer collection and you make a phone number collection. So inside the customer collection, customer information is saved. Inside the phone number collection, uh, document containing phone number information is saved. So for each phone number document, we can add a reference to the corresponding customer document. So this sounds very familiar, right? So usually last time when we talk about relational database, basically we are doing this. So relational database is about a relationship between multiple tables. And to make those relationship, we are utilizing primary key and foreign key. And foreign key contains a reference information to the primary key in another table. So referencing is basically similar to relational database approach. So assume that we have these two design choice and based on each of the design choice, if we provide the document structure to contain data in a collection, then it will be like this. For the embedding approach, we will have only one customer collection and each customer document in the 
cosmological collection will look like this. So a document here, it will have a CID, customer ID. It will have a name information, like customer information. It will have a phone number field. And in this phone number field, we we'll embed a list of phone numbers like this. That's a possible design if we use embedding approach. Basically, phone numbers are here embedded inside customer document. Another approach we can utilize is a referencing approach. If you use a referencing approach, basically, we we'll have a customer collection and phone collection separately. It, uh, in the customer collection, each document will have information about unique customer. So customer ID one, his information will be saved here as a separate document inside the customer collection. And phone number will not be saved here. Phone number will be saved inside phone collection. So for phone number one, two, three, four, five, we add a reference of this customer. Who has this, cost, who has this phone number, which is customer ID one. Also for phone number 77777, customer ID one, is the owner of this phone number like this. So we can use this as a reference to the customer document. Now there are two potential approach and which data model design should we adopt? So here, this is a tricky part. We have to think about it carefully. And we can compare this with the relational database design. So this is what we talked briefly last time. So if we are going to uh, build something like this in the relational database system, we will have a customer table, we will have a phone number table, and then we will utilize primary key and foreign key to make an association between these two tables. And then later when we want to retrieve information, we we'll use something called join. So join is a process of combining data from multiple tables. So we will use uh, this join to match data from two or more tables. So CID here will be matched to CID here to retrieve the information we want to know. And what we talked last time is that join is uh, there, but the join is a very costly uh, process. It's very time consuming. It's very time taking. Uh, that's why people are, uh, that's one of the disadvantage of a relational database. That's what we discussed last time. It's because for each customer, we have to scan entire phone number table. For the next customer, we have to scan entire phone number table again to find this match. That's why it takes longer. That's why it's very time consuming. That's what we discussed last time. So in the end, we uh, find out that if we have n number of information in the customer table, and if we have m number of information in the uh, phone number table, then total number of operation, the MySQL will perform using uh, join will be n multiplied by m. So it will be a huge number and a lot of operations the relational database need to conduct. So it will be slow. That's what we discussed last time. However, is it true? Will it be really slow like this if we use a relational database? Actually, that's not true because thanks to the optimization, so again, relational database has used in the industry for so long time, over the past years, over the past decades, actually. So during these times, people try to make the relational database faster. So there are a lot of optimization techniques embedded inside the relational database. So in the most of the times, if your company size is small or medium, if you are not dealing with like a really huge amount of data, the relational database is actually okay for most of the task because of the optimization. And one of the optimization they use in join process is merge join. So merge join is one way of uh, making the process more efficient. And what they do is that they sort the tables based on the matching field first. So if you have a primary key and foreign key uh, made inside the table, then MySQL, for example, and other relational database system will automatically sort those tables uh, and yeah, sort those tables and save a copy in their database system. So for example, if you have this customer table, then CID is primary key. 
So relational database will have a copy of this customer table by sorting based on CID. So the CID number is just small and it's increasing over time. For the same thing for the phone number tables. For the phone number table, we have a foreign key here, CID. Then relational database system will store information in another table after sorting based on CID here. So this phone, number, phone table is sorted based on CID like this. Why they do that? Because it can increase the performance of join. How? Here is the example. So let's say that once the tables are sorted like this, based on CID here and here, then you can really gain huge increase in the performance. So for the first customer whose ID is one, two, three, we find a match here in the phone table, right? So here there's a match. So we put the result into the query result table. Here we found the match. So we put the result here. And the next CID of the phone number information is a 274. This is not a match with this, it's a higher. So we stop the process here, we don't need to scan entire table in this case because it's sorted based on CID. Then we stop here and we go to the next customer. And when we go to the next customer, we don't need to scan from the beginning anymore because already we know that the numbers here are smaller than this. So we start from where we stopped. So we check here, same, there's match. So we put into the result and next one, this is bigger. So we stop here and we go to the next customer and we find the match and we add into the results like this. So by doing this, the total number of operation, the relational database need to perform are not n times m anymore. Simply total number of lead operation, the relational database need to do is just n plus m now, plus cost of sorting. So usually these sorted tables are done much beforehand, not at the time of execution of the query. So if we assume that relational database already have this sorted tables, total lead operation, uh, the MySQL need to perform when you ask to do join is only N plus M. So in this case, it will be really fast. So that's what's happening in the relational database. So relational database is not always slow, depending on how they optimize the process and how you are utilizing. Then the question is this, if you use NoSQL like MongoDB in this situation, it will be faster than relational database. Let's just say that you use the MongoDB and NoSQL, which is a, like a big data system basically, which is more complex than the traditional database system. So you put a lot of effort, you design the something and you use the new technology, but the speed and performance is worse. It's much slower Then there's no point of using this, right? So that's just something you have to consider. So let's look at this. We earlier presented the embedding and referencing approach of a designing document. If you use the embedding approach like this, all the phone numbers are inside customer document. Then let's say that in the MongoDB, we want to find a customer whose ID is one. And we want to find all the phone numbers of this customer with the customer information. Then if you use the embedding approach, you just need to use the find function on customer collection with the CID information like this. Then, if you have an n number of a customer in our system, then the total number of operation the MongoDB needed to perform is only n at maximum, right? Because we have n number of uh, customers. We just scan all the we just scan all the customer documents, find whether CID is one. If we find a match, we retrieve phone number information together with the customer information. So total lead operation we can take is N. So in this case, it's good, right? Because it's faster than using relational database. Relational database, it was N plus M. So it's faster in this case. If you use a referencing approach, slightly different thing happening. So we have a 
n number of customer information with the CID, m number of phone number information stored like this. So there is a phone number with the CID information. So first of all, uh, customer ID one, we want to find out his uh, customer information and phone number information. So for the customer information, we have to look at customer collection. So we find a match and we retrieve customer information. Then total time of operation to take is N, right? Because there are N number of customer. And for the phone, uh, and then we also have to find the phone number for this customer and we have to look at the phone collection. So in the phone collection, there are M number of phones. We have to look at each one to find whether the CID is one. If there is a match, we retrieve this information and say that this is a phone number owned by CID one. So for this, it takes M number of times. So the total number of operation it takes for MongoDB to perform this operation is basically N plus M plus cost of additional request to database. What it means is this, in this case, I use only one function. So we send the request from here to the database server and database server process the request and send the result back to me. In this case, we have to utilize two code. So at first we have to send the request for the customer collection to the database and database return information. And then we have to also send another, um, uh, another like operation to the server and server has to look at the phone number collection and has to return back our information. So it required two trips to the database and sending a request to the database and getting the results back from database. That's also time consuming operation because it's moving between different systems. And in the relational database, if we use join, it's only one request to the database. So in this case, even though N plus M part is the same because you have to send one more request to the database, Actually, theoretically, uh, it will be slower than utilizing simple relational database. So that's uh, something you have to consider when you utilize and when you design a document in the MongoDB. Depending on how you design document structure, the speed of operation and the speed of the entire system uh, you are utilizing will really vary. It can be fast, it can be slow. It depends on your documented structure, basically. So here is another example. So we can think about this as a kind of a, a case study or a kind of a simple exercise. So let's assume that uh, we have this uh, Twitter like a service. So uh, everyone here uh, probably is familiar with the Twitter like application. So basically there is, a, uh, this is a, the screen I captured from uh, Obama's Twitter. So if I go over to Twitter, there are some uh, his information and there are like tweets he posted recently. So there are like four or five tweets he posted recently. And if I go to the next page, there are more tweets like this. What we want to do here is this, we want to design data model in MongoDB for user and tweet information. So there are some user information about Obama like this. And there are tweet information he wrote like this. And when we go to Obama's account, Obama's Twitter account, we want to show this tweet information and the user information together as soon as possible, as fast as possible, because speed is the most important thing in the online service. So in this case, should we use embedding or referencing? So that's the question. So let's think about both cases, what happens? If we use embedding approach for this task, our user document inside the user collection will look like this. So we have a user collection. Each user document contains user information, like user ID one and maybe user name and other information. And the tweet information will be embedded inside user document because we are using embedding approach. So we will have a tweet field and we will have a list of embedded documents like this. So first tweet, second tweet, third tweet, like this. In this design, there are several issues. First issue is this, how many tweets will be there? Actually, for the number of tweets you can post per person, there's no restriction, there's no limitation. If you want, you can post a thousand tweets. If you want, you can post like a million tweets like this, right? So if you use embedding approach and if you try to embed the entire tweet inside the user document, this doesn't make sense because there will be too many tweets in here in this one field. 
And also, that means that if there are too many tweets in one field, this user document, the size will grow exponentially. So basically, we will have one document which is really huge, which contains really too many information. And that is very inefficient, like because when we retrieve a document, if the size is too big, it will also slow down the process. So in MongoDB, we have this limitation. So one of the limitations of MongoDB is this. They have a size limit of each document as a 16 megabyte. So they are kind of trying to block uh, for the document to grow too big. So this design doesn't work, basically. So another problem is what if someone tried to search over all the tweets? So in the Twitter, we have a search functionality. So you can use that to search across many different tweets posted by many different people. And then tweet information in this case is embedded inside the user document together with the other user information. But when we provide the search functionality, we don't care about user information, right? We only need to go through the tweet and search. However, in this case, to search over tweet, we have to retrieve each user information, each user document from the user collection. And we have to also separate this tweet information and we have to look at each tweet here. So there are multiple steps we have to perform. So it's not efficient. The process of searching here in this design is not efficient. Also, what if a user posts a new tweet? So this is another problem. So if user posts a new tweet, we have to add a new tweet data here inside this tweet uh, field, which is embedded inside user document. So user information needed to be accessed first, even though most of the information we don't need it. And then we have to add a tweet here and we have to update the entire user document like this. So the process, it takes multiple steps. So write operation will be slower in that case. So there are several issues by utilizing embedding option. And what if we use a referencing approach? So referencing approach is like this. We separate user and tweet collection. So in the user collection, each document contain only user information. In the tweet collection, each document refers to each tweet. So we have a certain tweet written by user ID one, another tweet written by user ID one like this. And user ID two, there will be another tweet like this. There are problems with the referencing too. One of the problem is that you require two trips to the database. So this is what we discussed earlier, right? So when you use referencing approach, uh, a certain person went to Obama's account on the Twitter. Then we have to show Obama's information from the user collection. So we have to send a request here and get the result back. And also we want to show the recent tweets written by Obama. So we have to look at the tweet collection and get the results and send the results to the user. So first we have to search and access user information. And then we have to search and access tweets of the user. So it's a time uh, consuming. Uh, this is not good because people want to see tweet information immediately when they access a user page. So if the system is slow, when you provide this kind of online service, uh, people will be impatient. So it's very important to provide fast service as much as possible. So slow read operation is a big problem when you use referencing approach. So what should we do here? So in this case, we can actually utilize hybrid approach. We can take the advantage of embedding approach. We can also take the advantage of referencing approach together. So what we can do is this, keep recent tweets only in user document for instant access on user page. So when a certain person goes to Obama's page, we want to show Obama's information together with his recent tweet fast. So we can simply embed the recent tweets inside user documents. So we can make a document like this. In the user collection, every user document contains five recent tweets. So user ID is here, user information is here. And in the recent tweet field, we can only contain five latest tweets written by this person. In this case, the number of tweets included here is fixed, right? As a five, only five tweets. So in the future, when a certain user go to uh, access this user ID one's uh, Twitter account, we show we just retrieve information from user collection and show this to the user. All information necessary is stored here. So we don't need to send another request to the tweet collection, right? So it will be faster. 
And for, how about for the older tweet? How about for the other tweets, not the recent five tweets? Then for that, we use referencing approach. So for other older tweet, we simply store inside the tweet collection. So later, this person look at Obama's first page and he wanna see the next page or he want to scroll down to see more tweets. Then now we search over the tweet collection and we search additional information and show that to the user. So provide more tweets when it's being requested. And if you do that, search over tweet is also separated from user collection. Because in the future, uh, if another user wants to search over tweets, we don't need to extract the user information. We can just go to tweet collection and search over tweets. So it will be faster. So in this case, the read operation will be fast. Search operation will be fast like this. So that's why sometimes you will see this. I mean, you can try this. Actually, if you go to uh, Twitter, like on the web, then, and if you go to Obama's like, Twitter account or any other like Twitter account, it will show recent tweet. And if you scroll down really fast, then you will see this circle button. It like moves a little bit. And about a few seconds later, it will show more tweets. It's because uh, they, uh, they may not use exactly the system that I implemented here, uh, but they are utilizing something like this. So they are putting the recent information together so that they can show it fast. And later when people are requesting more, then they search database in another collection and they show additional information to the user like this. So that's why you are seeing this kind of design in many of the online services system these days. So I received some questions. So let me uh, look at this. So this is uh, oh, so this is going to ask you do recent tweets to, to be stored in the tweet collection also. So uh, this is a little bit specific question, right? So basically here, uh, you are asking whether this recent tweet also need to be stored here, right? Uh, it depends on uh, your design. So I think uh, in this case, yes, I would do that actually if I implemented this system, because uh, if I don't store this recent tweet here, I cannot make correct search functionality. So that's one thing. So I would do that in this specific case. And another question was this, why is it not okay to directly search within a number tweet collection, a uh, tweet collection in a referencing design? Why is it not okay to direct search between? Uh, Let me see. I'm not sure whether I understand the question correctly. So you're asking, so in the referencing here, referencing design, why is it not okay to directly search within number of tweet collection in the reference? Day? So in this case, actually the search operation will be fast, right? So the problem is the slow read. The search functionality over tweet will be fast in this case because all the tweet information is stored in the tweet collection. So if someone tried to search a certain tweet based on, I don't know, nice job, then they type this word, then we can just go over entire tweet and search this text. So that search operation will be fast. But the problem is the lead operation, slow lead operation. So when I go to a certain user, like a user ID one's uh, profile page, then here we have to show user information of this user ID one and his recent tweets, right? But in this case, for user information, I have to extract it from here. For this information, I have to extract it from here. So that's why it will be slower in that case. But the search operation will be fast in this design. So uh, with the hybrid approach, so another question here. Mm. This is actually a very good question. So you think very, yeah, basically you think one step ahead. So that's also another thing I want to mention. So with the hybrid approach, the system needs to update this part, right? this part, uh, each time a new tweet is added, right? So when a person, so in this hybrid design, the worst part will be slow, light operation. Because when a user add a new tweet, then we have to add that tweet here in the tweet collection. And also we have to go to the user document and we have to add this new tweet here and delete 
the last tweet, right? If there are already five tweets here. So it, ha it, it, has, a, it has to update this part a lot. So that are, there are multiple steps involved for that operation. So the write operation will be actually slow because of updating user document. But something you have to think is this. This might be actually okay. It's okay for whether it's okay to have a slow write. That's something you can think. So there are many different operations you provide in your online application. And in the big data system, you have to think which part is the most important and which part is most critical for performance. So one thing is this. Lead operation, search operation, write operation. We have like these three main things here, right? So what is most important? If you have to choose what is the most important among these three operations, what would you say? So I would say the lead operation is the most important. Why? Because of the because this is most frequently performed operation. Most of people who are using social network will utilize most of the time to read posts, right? So this is the most heavily used and most frequently used operation. And if read operation is slow, many people will not use that service. So in this social network service, in this kind of online service, usually in many cases, providing fast read operation is very important. And second important operation is a search. Many people also search. Like in YouTube, you search something. In the social network, you search something like that. So search operation is the second important operation. It should be fast. And the least important operation is actually light in this case, in this specific case. Why? Let's say that I wrote down something. I added a new tweet into the system. It takes five seconds for my profile page to be updated. It's okay, right? However, you want to read something, you click some article, it takes five seconds to wait to read a certain article. You will not be fine, right? So that's because many people are gonna perform read operation. And the write operation, you write something and you will it, it doesn't matter, right? After five seconds, other people will see. That's a fine, right? They will see anyway, five seconds later. So that kind of a trade-off you have to consider in the online service. So right operation, even though it's slow, usually it's okay. Lead operation, if it's slow, people will not use your service. So that's uh, one of the important things you have to consider. So that's just something, uh, yeah, basically something important to consider when you design documented structure uh, in the NoSQL system. So here we are using the case of MongoDB, but even for other big data system, you already have to think how your application will be performed and what type of operation is most important and in which part of operation I have to guarantee faster performance. So you have to think about that when you design a big data system. So that's a, a very good question you uh, actually had. So you were thinking one step ahead actually. And yeah, that's my answer basically. Okay, so basically uh, between embedding and referencing choice, uh, referencing choice over documented design, uh, these are uh, one of the, these are some of the like unique difference. So embedding usually it's good when the document will be small, the sub document is small. Like if we, if we only need to embed five recent activity, it's okay, but if we have to embed everything, it's best. It's better to do referencing, and it's better to separate it. If you use embedding, it's good when the data does not change regularly. Because, again, as I told you, uh, based on previous example, when something is embedded, updating that information is costly. So, if the information does not change regularly, it's actually good example to embed inside the main document. And volatile data, the information that changes regularly, uh, it is better to do referencing. 
and documents that grow by a small size, it's okay to do embed. And documents that has a large amount, uh, it's better to separate so that the document size is not too big. And also data that you often need to show access together for the fast access, fast read operation, it's better to embed. Data that you often exclude from research, you don't need to embed. So to provide a fast read operation, embedding is usually better. To provide a fast write or read, uh, not read, search operation, referencing is usually better. So that's uh, the main difference between uh, these two choices. So that's the summary of design choices here. And uh, I also gave you some of the examples. So let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, other cases here. So for data modeling in NoSQL, uh, in these other cases, what do you think? Should we use embedding or referencing? So for example, user account preference. So in the social media these days, you can make your uh, profile as a public or private or something like that. So user account preference. Do you think embedding will be better or referencing approach will be better? Like, should you embed this preference in the user account, a user document, or do you have to make another collection to store account preference separately? What do you think? Okay, many, yeah. So many of you say embedding, and that's true. So in this case, it's a very small document, right? It's just uh, uh, some preference of the user. And also, when we show user account information, we also have to uh, show some information and hide some information based on their preference. So embedding is better in this case. How about this? A list of friends in social network. So in social network, you can have a friendship with other users and uh, you may have a lot of friends or you may have a small number of friends depending on your activity. So list of friends information in social network. Should we use embedding or referencing? What do you think? You can use the Zoom chat box to type what you think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying referencing. Yeah, that's correct. So this one, referencing would be better, right? One of the reasons is that you don't know uh, how many friends you will have. It can, it can grow exponentially over time. You may have a lot of friends. So embedding all the friends list inside user document together is very inefficient approach. If you want to include a certain like a few recent friends, then you can also use a hybrid approach, but embedding would do that. Embedding only will not be a good approach basically. So recent activity, I mean, it's the same as what we did earlier, right? So recent activity, we can just embed. It's not a lot, like, like recent five activity. We want to show together with the user account information then we can just embed. And how about this content generated by user, something like YouTube. So in YouTube or other like this kind of entertainment or social network, uh, people usually make a video and they make a, a unique content and they may they do like this kind of activity and those contents should we embed inside the user document or not and hybrid and so in this case there are concerns so one concern is how big this content will be if the content is too big embedding is actually not a good approach in this case because uh, if you embed like a big amount of information in user document together when we only need a user document, we, this information will be distributed together. So it will be too much like a, a process. So in this case, if the content is big, like YouTube, like a video with like 15 minutes or 30 minutes or one hour, two hour, then in that case, because of the size, a referencing approach might be better. Of course, the content is a very, very small one, like a, uh, textual information, your short clips, then some of those information we can embed so hybrid can be another way in that case. But if we assume content will be big, then referencing approach might be better in this case. So those were some of the uh, discussion and the information. So you have to already think from the application perspective when you design the document structure for the NoSQL database. So here are some summary. So why do we use NoSQL? Because of a flexible data modeling and also because of the performance However, flexible data modeling doesn't mean that you can do anything. Actually, it's more difficult because a relational database system, you just follow some steps like a conceptual data modeling. 
relational data modeling, then you will have your database implemented. But here in NoSQL, in MongoDB, you have to be more carefully think. And also you need some creativity in terms of designing document structure to guarantee maximum performance. So in NoSQL, I would think that data modeling is more like an art rather than science. 